Okay, we're going to carry on with our second speaker um, just as soon as the last few people leave. Um, now we have Carl Johan Carlson, who's going to speak to us about Pallet Jack, a lightweight inventory management system. Yes, thank you. Uh, so, first, uh, defining what I mean by inventory management. We're talking for system administrators who don't run everything on somebody else's computers. They have to keep some semblance of order on their own computers. So we need some sort of database to store our IP addresses, system locations, serial numbers, things like that. And from this, we want to generate some uh, service configuration, like DHCP configuration and uh, SALT configuration, things like that. And we want to be able to search this database for static information, such as locations and service contracts when things break. And uh, there are several uh, such systems already. Uh, we were looking for one that was a single source of truth for system administration, which means it has to be easily extensible uh, and supports don't repeat yourself modeling. We wanted it to be version controlled together with our configuration management system so we could feature freeze branches and revert to previous states. It needed to be easily interoperable so we can export information from this to different kinds of services. Uh, it needs to be reasonably scalable. We are not Google. Uh, we are aiming for 1,000 machines and a database of about 10,000 objects. And uh, it needs to be decomposable, uh, both vertically, because we package uh, some systems up and ship them off to a customer. And then we want that vertical slice to have its own database. And we also want the database to be horizontally decomposable so we can uh, separate responsibilities. For example, have automated scripts filling out some fields in the database. And we have achieved this by uh, building our own database or data store on a file system. Uh, because, as I said, the database is not very big. 10,000 objects, a file system is great. And we can have uh, objects as uh, directories and uh, uh, files storing YAML data with keys and values, symbolic links to inherit information between objects. This gives us a lot of tools. For example, we can store this directory tree in Git together with our salt states and get everything consistent. It means we can use our existing code review workflow to uh, handle changes in hardware configuration. It makes it easy for us to do vertical decomposition. Just check, uh, look at the systems we want, follow all the symlinks from those, uh, store those objects, and throw away the rest. That's our uh, small database we ship off to a customer. And since logical, logically separate information is in separate files, uh, we also get horizontal decomposition very easily. Um, yeah. To enable us not to repeat ourselves, we have a transformation system on our YAML keys. So, for example, as you can see here, we don't store the fully qualified domain name explicitly. We store the host name and the DNS domain separately. And then we have uh, this synthesized thing that uh, concatenates those to a new key. And we have a couple of different uh, ways of doing this and regular expressions to pull out different parts of data. Now, uh, this is just uh, directories and files, so you can uh, handle this with just mkdir and emacs, but we have a couple of uh, easy to use tools like create system, which just creates an empty system object uh, with uh, a YAML template, which you can fill out with all your details, and uh, some debugging tools like dump palette here, which dumps all the information the database has about a single object. Uh, and since we have all uh, a lot of inheritance and transformations in the system, uh, the dump palette also can show where in which file each uh, data key comes from, which is nice for debugging. 
Now, this database is completely useless unless you can do something with the data. So we have some data export tools as well. Uh, this is Palletjack to Kea, which creates configuration for the Kea DHCP server. You just uh, run the, the script, give it the, uh, the directory for the database, and it spits out. So th this is a DHCP server, so it spits out the DHCP configuration with reservations for all the hosts in the database. This is intended to be run automatically. Uh, we have it set up as a git post receive hook. So every time we push uh, a new uh, a change to this database, we run these scripts. They then deposit the new configuration files into our salt repository, and salt then checks if they've changed and uploads them to the servers. We can currently generate configuration for salt. We can uh, install CentOS systems using Pixie Linux and K Kickstart. We can uh, configure DHCP servers through Kia. We can run uh, DNS with not and unbound. And we are working on uh, free IPA integration. So you, you are supposed to just enter a host in the database and run the script, and then you get the free IPA host object and uh, all the Kerberos stuff. Uh, writing new service integrations we find to be quite easy using the Ruby API. Uh, this is an example run in IRB, the, the Ruby interactive shell. Just uh, require uh, the, uh, the library, then uh, palletjack.load to load the entire database from disk, run all the transformations and the inheritance. And then you get uh, system, uh, system objects that, which you can look at uh, properties of, for example, we pick out here uh, the system named VMHost1, and we look at its uh, role for the salt configuration management system, and we find that, oh, it's a KVM server and it's an SSH server. Uh, or you can filter and loop over all systems and do all sorts of things. Uh, there are also a couple of helper libra libraries for uh, common things like creating configuration files. If you want to uh, try this yourself. It's published on GitHub. Uh, Palletjack is the library. Palletjack tools is the, uh, are the tools. Uh, we're developing this on GitHub uh, on that horrible long URL, but Palletjack is a unique word, so just search GitHub for that, unlike Forklift, which, which was our first uh, name suggestion. That's horribly overloaded. Uh, we're Happy to take patches. Uh, and uh, lastly, we'd like to thank our employer, which is the Saab Flight Simulation Center, for letting us uh, develop, develop this as free software. And that was quick, so I think we have time for questions. We've got a couple of minutes for questions, if anyone has questions, and then we're going to have a short break um, before the next speaker, so we've got a, a few minutes now. Any questions? Can you uh, go back to the slides? I think it was the third one or something where you showed the Simlink hierarchy in the file system. This one. Yeah, mainly because I want to take a photo, but also because uh, <laughs> I wanted to ask. Uh, so there are a couple of YAML files here. Um, do you just merge them? Is that the idea? You have yeah. a couple of symlinks and then the YAML files, you just merge them? Exactly. So when, you, uh, when the Ruby library loads uh, the database, it collects all the YAML files uh, in each directory, merges those uh, key trees, and then it also follows all the symlinks and merges those as well. And uh, everything there uh, gets, yeah, you, you can, from an object, you can read all the all the keys which have been merged and inherited and things. So two questions. Oh, sorry, a bit loud. So two questions. Um, first one: What CI do you use uh, attached to Git? I'm assuming that you, your changes are triggered by a CI engine at the back end, or uh, not currently? No, currently no. we're doing that manually. Okay. Um, so probably. Uh, 
tied into that um, would be when do you have the ability to get an event stream of a change at the back? So obviously Git's going to be able to track, you know, machine X has moved from rack Y to Z or, you know, it's changed its operating system. Is there a way or have you envisaged a way that you can detect that change and then trigger off the back of that? Well, uh, currently we're envisioning doing that manually because that's if you're moving a machine from one rack to another, you're al already doing something manually. Correct, yeah. Uh, but yeah, we're, we're using Zabbix for uh, monitoring, so maybe you could uh, hook it into that. So that'd be a good example where a um, uh, new server's racked and you want to update or create the machine in Zabbix, an event, have you envisaged how you might do that? Yeah, th that's possible. We're not doing that now, but mm -hmm. uh, it's perfectly possible. Because uh, if you want to do something, it's only it's only text files, so a anything could create or change information in this. Of course, yeah. Thank you. Since no one else is asking, I think uh, this looks a lot like LDAP to me. So you're pulling in like symlinks, you know, with which define their own like schema or so on. Uh, how do you ensure that? There's sort of like required information provided, and that how do you resolve conflicts between the different hierarchies or schemata that are in here? Uh, well, there are two parts of that. First, uh, required information. We actually don't validate anything until export time because we want it to be uh, very extendable. And uh, if a, a piece of information is not there, then that's not a fatal error. You just skip over that. Like if it. If a system doesn't have a MAC address, okay, we don't generate a DHCP reservation for it. Uh, what was the second part, sorry? <laughs> um, conflicts, like let's say domain and machine have different uh, yeah, conflicting uh, data uh, in them. Exactly. Um, there is a uh, uh, more specific information always overrides inherited information. So for example, the symlinks here. Uh, the symlink that points to a domain, but uh, yeah, DNS domain. But uh, the machine test VM could have its own uh, DNS domain configuration in its own YAML files, and that always overrides the inherited information. Is there anyone else? Okay, thank you very much. Thank you.